Elden Ring continues to live rent-free in my head. Vadi's deep dive lore videos, Illusory Wall's mechanical deep dives, and Zuli the Witch's coverage of the game's various oddities are still mainstays in my YouTube feed, but the various challenge runs are by far my favorite. Torch only, pacifist, butt only, overloaded, shield only. It seems like the possibilities are endless, but at the same time, this is YouTube. This platform is huge, and so is Elden Ring's popularity, so chances are if it can be done, it has been done. I started my shield only run partially because I noticed that it hadn't been done yet, but Plateau Peak ended up beating me to the punch on that one. And even though at the end of that video I claimed no more challenge videos for a while, I didn't feel like I was done just yet. But this time, I really, really wanted to be the first to complete one. I had to find something so ridiculous. Something so difficult, something so immensely painful that nobody in their right mind would even want to attempt it. And so I had an idea. The Briar Armor. The Briar Armor is a special set of armor that you can buy from the Finger Maiden in Round Table Hold after defeating an early mid-game boss in a fort on the Altus Plateau. Equipping any piece of this armor will cause you to do damage to an enemy if you roll into it, with the damage increasing exponentially with each piece equipped. Against this soldier near the beginning of the game, you can see it does 1 damage with 1 piece, 4 damage with 2, 11 with 3, and 21 with 4. It's not a lot, but damage is damage. So against my better judgment, I decided to subject myself to this torture and record it for your entertainment. It's worth noting that there are a few so-called roll-only challenge runs that exist already, but all of these use a special Ash of War called Lightning Ram to get through the game. They're fun runs, but Lightning Ram, despite it being a bit of a joke, is still pretty viable. It does lightning damage and scales with stats and weapon upgrades, so powered up, the damage is still pretty good at the cost of awkward and dangerous movement. But I ain't about that life. Here are my rules for this run. 1. Roll Only any damage I do must come from the Briar Armor's roll. No weapons, no attacking, no offensive spells, and no Ashes of War. This applies to everything I do. Between bosses, between cuts, all boss attempts, and even rune farming will all be done without attacking enemies in a traditional sense. This also means creating a new character, so all talismans and spells I want will have to be unlocked within these limitations. 2. Solo only. I've had commenters complain that not using summons is against the game's design, and while that might be true, the game is also designed with the ability to solo in mind. Summons are extremely powerful and fundamentally change any boss fight and can often trivialize encounters. This is a challenge run, and especially with this kind of challenge, any damage done by summons just kind of invalidates the challenge itself. And 3. No blocking. Great shields are generally pretty competent in this game, and it might make aspects of the run easier, but nah, I don't want to block anything. I should be rolling enough anyway, right? And for this run, I'm not explicitly disallowing cheese or glitches, but I am going to mostly avoid things like AI freeze cheese, and will attempt to fight bosses as honestly as I can. Make no mistake, this is gonna suck, but I'm in the business of misery, and I am gonna take this to the top. I hope. First things first, we gotta create a character. I wanted to focus on four stats, Vigor, Mind, Endurance, and Faith, and chose the class with the best spread of those, with as few wasted points and everything else for its starting level, and ended up with the Prophet. I figured for this challenge to be possible, we'll need to take advantage of some support incantations, so it's nice to start with a decent Mind and Faith stat here. It's also really important to create the character with as many spikes on him as humanly possible for more damage, and here he is. Isn't he just beautiful? My friend says he looks like a cursed Mario, and I think I agree. We won't be needing any equipment yet, so I strip down, roll into the grafted scion a few times just for the lulls, and then straight off the cliff so we can get this run rolling. Probably the worst part of any challenge run, or even just creating a new character, is running around to collect all the available golden seeds and sacred tears on the map. It's a bit tedious, but if you know where you're going, you can end up with a healthy 8 plus 5 flasks within 30 to 40 minutes just from Kaelid and Limgrave. You could get more from taking the side path to skip Stormvale and grab everything from Liurnia and Altus, but I find it's best to break up this task, and this is more than enough for now. Along the way, I also picked up the two halves of the Grand Dectus Medallion, the Green Dog Tower talisman for stamina regeneration, and the flame grant me strength incantation for later. With that done, all that's left is to acquire my armor. One big roadblock to this run is that you can't acquire the armor until Altus Plateau, and you must beat a boss to do it. 
Problem is, I can't do damage outside of rolling, so I can't kill the boss. But there is an easy solution to this. I already have the armor on my first character, so I just summoned in a friend to transfer the armor for me. And now that I'm fully equipped, I could take on Margit, but there's a couple more things I want to take care of first. Boss fights are going to take a long time. A really, really long time. And because I'm not using any weapons or offensive spells and won't be blocking, there is a very limited selection of useful talismans available to me. But one that will be very useful over the course of a long fight will be a talisman that is almost completely useless in a normal playthrough, the Blessed Dew Talisman. You can get this by visiting the Tower of Return on the Weeping Peninsula and letting the chest at the top whisk you away. This talisman grants you a permanent 2 health per second of healing. That's 120 health per minute and 1200 health per 10 minutes. It might not sound very valuable right now, but you'll see. You'll all see. And next I wanted some runes, but the tried and true method of bleeding the sleeping dragon in Kaelid to death isn't really possible here. I guess I could roll into it for a few hours, but that's boring. Instead, there's a spot in front of the bridge to Redmain Castle where a bunch of soldiers are fighting those hideous raptor dog things, and because of the way this game works, if something dies, you get the runes. It's pretty slow, but you can speed things up a bit by luring a few more dogs and one ugly bird into the fight. It's only about five or six thousand runes per cycle, but it's more than enough to get me started, and personally I've always loved watching in-game NPCs duke it out in games like this. More fun than rolling into soldiers or a giant dragon for hours at least. After about an hour and a half, I had nearly 130,000 runes, enough to reach level 39 and pump my vigor and endurance up to some pretty healthy amounts. All that's left is to ride up to Stormvale and face the game's first boss. Margit is the first big boy of just about any challenge run, and this is where we begin to see the true essence of what this run will entail. I'm going to be using these acronyms and stat blocks for all the bosses throughout this run, so let me explain it real quick. First, you have the health of the boss. That's pretty obvious, and I got that from the Fextra Life wiki. Second is DPR, which is damage per roll. This is the raw damage that I do to this boss every time I roll into it. It can be affected by buffs, but more often than not, I'm going to be doing this base damage. And finally, we have RTK, or rolls to kill. I need to roll into the boss this many times to kill it. This can be affected by buffs to my damage, but not by much. And what we can see from Margit is that he has just under 4200 health, and I'm only dealing 20 damage every time I roll into him. And with that, it's going to take 209 rolls to kill him. I did do some tests to see what the maximum number of rolls per second a character can achieve is, which is slightly above 1.3 rolls per second, but ultimately I decided that the information is kind of useless. Plugging in the numbers, if I achieved the maximum of 1.3 rolls per second, then Margit would be dead in merely 2 minutes and 32 seconds, but that doesn't account for stamina or moments where I'm not rolling as I wait for the boss to make a move so I can attack safely. The actual time to beat for my winning attempt will be shown at the end of each boss fight. For this fight I used the green dog talisman and I started using the incantation I picked up in Kaelid, Flame Grant Me Strength. I didn't want to waste any of my flasks on FP restoration, so I didn't have many casts of this available, but I did try to keep it up as much as would make sense. It lasts a piddly 30 seconds, but it increases my damage by 20% for the duration. Normally, when it comes to buffs, you look at the damage increases as this buff makes my 500 damage attack deal 600 damage and stacks with this talisman to deal 700. But with this run, I try to look at it in the opposite direction. For every five hits I manage to land with this buff active, that's one less roll I need to hit over the entire course of the boss fight. <laughs> Saying it out loud makes it sound completely stupid and pointless. 30 seconds is not a long time when it takes many minutes to defeat a single boss, and casting this spell is pretty risky and tends to sacrifice openings that could be used for offense. So it's hard for me to say if it's really worth the cost, 
We're running an endurance challenge here, not a burst the boss before you run out of flasks one. So every second is precious. You know, before actually starting this run, I spent a few days deliberating on whether or not I really wanted to subject myself to this torture. I tested a few things, and one of the tests was, can I actually beat Margit this way? And much to my surprise, I managed to do it. So this wasn't the first time I beat Margit in this way, so I came in already prepared. I managed to get him down in my second attempt here, which is more like my 10th attempt if you count the test run. All in all, not too bad. Time to beat, 7 minutes and 15 seconds. Like before, if you're interested in seeing the full fights of each of these bosses instead of just the condensed versions I present here, a full compilation is posted over on my now defunct Let's Play channel. I highly recommend you don't watch it because these fights get absurdly long, but it's there for proof and posterity, and it might also be useful as a study guide for the bosses that show up and how to accurately avoid their attacks if you're having trouble. Anyway, next is a trip through Stormvale. None of the talismans here are worth grabbing, so I went in through the front and just blitzed my way to Godric, taking a brief detour for another Golden Seed. Unlike before, I didn't fight Godric in my test run, so we're officially in new territory now. Remember how Margit took seven minutes? Here, let's play a little game. Start writing down your guesses for how many minutes you think each boss will take as I cover them, but before I give you the answer. At the end of the video, leave a comment with all of your guesses. It'll be fun to see what people's best guesses for this run's bosses are compared to the actual time to beat. Please don't cheat, there's nothing on the line for this, you're not gonna win anything, it's just a fun little game. Anyway, next boss. We're only on the second boss, and the health has already increased by 50%. Luckily, Godric's defenses don't seem to be any better than Margit's, so at least our damage is the same as before. My talismans for this fight were the Green Dog and the Blessed Dew. I did my best to maximize openings during this fight, and only casted Flame grant me strength when I was already sacrificing an opening to chug a flask. Something to note about this run is that since I don't have to waste precious time swinging a weapon, I don't have to leave myself open with normal attacking animations. The best form of offense I have is dodging through enemy hitboxes as they swing, which will deal damage back to them. The more I struggled on a boss, the more I learned how to abuse this, and the more competent and quick I became. Because each fight takes so long, I have literally nothing else to do but sit there and learn the exact attack patterns and triggers of each boss I fight, which can allow me to be ever more aggressive. I managed to defeat Godric on my first attempt here, so you won't see much of that in this fight, but you'll see what I'm talking about later. My main sources of damage here were his earthquake attacks, which are easy enough to jump over and punish, and his whirlwind ability. This move comes out extremely fast, and over the course of a long fight, risks chipping down my health too much to risk staying in melee at all times. I spent most of my time sitting back and waiting for him to make a move, but when he did, I made sure to maximize my minimal punish on him. The whirlwind ability is a great move to bait though, because if you end up as close as possible to him without taking damage, he will almost always choose to jump attack you instead of passing gas, and that jump attack leaves him wide open. Godric isn't too difficult, even in a run like this. One try? <laughs> I think I'm on a roll. <laughs> I'm beginning to worry though, because these bosses are already taking an ever-increasing amount of time to defeat. Time to beat? 17 minutes. More than double market. With Stormvale conquered, it's time to head into Liurnia. The first two bosses are down, but there are many more to go. First things first, though, it's time for more flask chores. So I spent another half hour or so traipsing around the lake and up on the plateau for more seeds and tears, and I start thinking about my future in this run. One of the biggest challenges of this run is that it takes extremely long to kill anything. I'm pretty decent at this game, but I'm not so good that I can stomach being underleveled for this whole challenge. So I need to come up with a method to farm runes without hating my life, and the method I used earlier in Kaled was pretty crap when I started it. And that's when I had an idea. Iron Pineapple's pacifist run makes use of a specific spot in an endgame area, Mogwin's Palace, that I think 
I could take advantage of. There's a way to get there extremely early. You gotta make nice with white-faced Vare. You know, the jerk that calls you an incel at the beginning of the game? So I guess let's make nice. Vare gives you a bunch of bloody fingers to invade with. You gotta do this three times, win or lose, to advance the quest. For some reason, matchmaking was really slow for me, probably because I didn't have any upgraded weapons, so I bounced around to a few places to cause some chaos. It was actually much funnier than I thought it would be trying to roll people to death. I didn't expect to win, uh, but I gave these guys a ton of trouble despite being outnumbered. Turns out, taking damage makes people panic a little bit. And then there's this poor guy who was about to fight the Draconic Tree Sentinel who summoned an NPC and another friend. They just kept rolling into me and couldn't pin me down, so eventually he just started shooting at the Tree Sentinel. And I actually scored a single win. If you're watching this rolling arrow guy, I am so, so sorry. Anyway, now that that's finally over with, all that's left is to soak a rag in a dead maiden's blood, which is easy enough since I already visited the dead maiden church for the sacred tear and get my finger cut off and it's off to mug when we go. A quick ride to the other side of the zone later and here's my farming spot. All I gotta do is roll into these guys to wake them up while dodging all of their attacks and then jump over to this rock over here and they'll just throw themselves off the cliff for me. It's not exactly free since these red guys with the cruel sense of irony can roll into me and destroy me if I'm not careful. At this point I'm waking up like half of the sad boys, jumping to the rock, and then waking up the other half. This run nets me around 20,000 runes per cycle, which is a lot at this point, and about 45 minutes later I have enough runes to get my vigor to 40, endurance and mind to 22, and faith to 25, which is needed to be able to cast Golden Vow, an incantation that increases my attack and defense both by 15% and lasts 90 seconds. This stacks multiplicatively with flame grant me strength for a really nice damage boost. I also attempted to go to the abandoned cave in Kaled to claim the golden scarab talisman for the next time I decided to farm, but I got my face caved in by the pair of clean rot knights guarding it. Maybe next time. One last stop before Hogwarts, and it's the same place I found the most important tool for my shield run, Lux Ruins. This is Demon Human Queen Gillica. Unfortunately, the wiki doesn't have any information about her health, but it's not too important since Gillica is extremely easy. Her attacks swing incredibly wide and far past her crotch, which is unfortunately where I want to be for a majority of the time. She's pretty slow and pretty easy to dodge, and I was able to stay on the offense almost the whole time as a result. She's got really low health too, and is dead very quickly. Time to beat, 3 minutes and 30 seconds. During my quest to find any possible ways to increase the amount of damage my rolls deal, I found only one talisman that increases all damage by a raw amount, and Gillica was the one guarding it. I'm glad she was so easy, because it made the acquisition of the Ritual Sword Talisman pretty painless. As long as my health is full, I'll gain an extra 10% damage. Since my damage is so low, this is subject to rounding issues like 17 becoming 18, but any increase is worth it when the fight lasts so long. And as I get better and better at these fights, it becomes easier and easier to maintain maximum health, especially with passive regeneration. Anyway, with all my chores completed, it's time to head into Hogwarts, run past the Riff Raff, and punish a very good dog for no reason. This is the Red Wolf of Radagon, and it's a very, very good dog. Unfortunately, this good dog is in my way and attacks me, so <laughs> I'm sorry, it has to be put down. For this fight, I'm still using the Green Dog and Blessed Dew Talismans, but I open the fight by casting my new incantation, Golden Vow, to increase my roll damage in this fight from 19 to 22. Pretty respectable increase and lasts 90 seconds instead of 30, which means I can get a lot more value out of it. This fight was really messy on my end, but I may have overleveled a little bit in my farming since this boss wasn't dealing very much damage to me at all with each hit. Not much to say about this fight though, with such a small health pull, it was down fairly quickly. Time to beat? 3 minutes. It's all downhill from here. Our next target is just a quick run through the courtyard and up the stairs where I get a taste of my own medicine. I think this is what pain feels like! A quick run past this idiot, up the elevator, and through the fog wall, and we're at our next boss. Hush, little Culver. I'll soon birth thee anew. A sweeting, fresh, 
and pure. If you're watching this video, you're probably already aware of how this boss fight, and especially this phase of the fight, works. Renala floats in the air while her creepy little girls pelt you with books and fire. One of the girls will have some golden aura around her and flings books at you, and you've got to smack her to destroy the aura, which will then migrate to a new girl. After the third aura is dispelled, Renala will fall to the ground where you can wail on her. It's a bit of a gimmicky portion of the fight, but it's pretty easy once you understand and solve it. The girls aren't too threatening and the portion of the cycle where you can actually damage the boss is completely free, at least up until the point where she explodes and rises back into the air. There is a problem though. The damage portion of this phase doesn't last forever, and I can't really do any burst damage. During each cycle I can get anywhere between 12 to 14 rolls in depending on how efficient I am, which means I have to do this song and dance at no less than 13 times for each attempt on this boss. If I was positioned well when she fell, I could cast Flame Grant Me Strength since it's cheap and fast and then let loose, but that only helps so much. This portion of the fight was extremely tedious. What's interesting though is that Renala seems to play favorites with some of her girls. I noticed that the aura that bounced around wasn't completely random, and as long as a girl with an aura was still alive after the hit, she would probably get it again within a few rotations. This made it easier to find them, which was really helpful for this portion of the fight. Minor spoiler alert, but I beat this boss in two attempts. Phase one took me ten and a half minutes the first time, but only eight and a half the second. A good example of how this kind of run encourages pattern recognition and optimization. It also lasts so long and is so generally unthreatening that when fast forwarded, you can really see the blessed dew talisman putting in the work it was hired for. On to phase two. Send word far and wide. Of the last queen of Caria, Renala of the Full Moon. And the majesty of the night she conjureth. This is where the real fight with Renala begins. She's just mobile enough to be annoying, but her spells aren't particularly difficult to dodge. The most threatening thing she can do is twirling her weapon, since she can rotate pretty quickly with it activated, and it does a significant chunk of my health and damage. She'll cast this one a lot when you're in her face, so it can be hard to sneak in some damage consistently. She also really likes to cast her moon spell, and since I'm not willing to risk another 10 minutes on phase 1 just to find out a more efficient dodge and punish window for this attack, I opted to be a little slower and safer by building the distance to make her moon less threatening at the cost of my own aggression. At around 60% health, she starts summoning monsters. Dragons, trolls, wolves, and bloodhound knights. Holy crap, this complicated the fight in a huge way. I mean, yeah, her summons always complicate the fight, no matter what build you're running, but when it takes five minutes just to get her this low, you know you're in for a bad time for the rest of the fight. As I fought, I evolved a different strategy for each summon. For the dragon, I just focused on dodging until it disappeared. For the troll, she'll teleport away a short distance as the troll slams down. I'd build some distance from the troll and rush Renala, and the troll would usually disappear by the time I reached her. For the wolves, she doesn't teleport. It's risky, but it's such a good opening that I couldn't give up, so I would just roll into the crowd of wolves, staggering any wolf I happened to hit while damaging the boss at the same time. For the Bloodhound Knight, I would just... She summons a lot more often than I thought she did, and it ended up slowing down the fight a lot. So, in my Shield Hero video, I spent a chunk of my time talking about how bad some of the collision and hurt boxes are in this game, and yes, I mean hurt box and not hit box. The distinction is the portion of the weapon that collides with the enemy is the hit box, and the portion of the enemy that gets hit by the weapon is the hurt box. Unfortunately, a lot of commenters disagreed that I could even discuss such a thing because I was doing a challenge run that the game wasn't explicitly designed for. And I just gotta say, yes, I definitely can. If a meme run can have these issues, real weapons can too. Even if it's much rarer because of their greater reach, it can still happen. If you're spaced at the edge of your weapon's range and visually collide with the enemy's model, a hit should register, period. A stinky hurtbox is a stinky hurtbox no matter what weapon you're using. 
it'll just be harder to see the longer the range of your weapon is, especially combined with the general difficulty of accurately judging distances in three-dimensional space from an over-the-shoulder view on a 2D display. At least for the shield run, it's not a case of being a problem with the challenge run, it's a case of core mechanics not being quite properly tuned and some misalignment with the underlying character damage triggers and collision boxes. Despite being mitigated by more traditional weapons, it's still a valid critique, get over it. It doesn't make the game bad, so why are you so defensive? Critique is not the same as hatred. I don't know why people can't understand that. I'm bringing all this up here because unfortunately, <laughs> Renala has a bad case of a stanky hurt box. You'll be able to spot many, many times where I roll straight into Renala and don't get the damage. It's especially bad from her front for whatever reason. In this case, it might not even be a hurt box problem, just a collision model problem, which does become an issue for the roll armor, but not really an issue for any actual weapon. Personally, I think if I hit the enemy's collision with this, I should be able to get the damage. This is still an item that can be used during any other normal run, and it's just a little cheap to not get the damage even if you're colliding with the enemy. Anyway, I'll be calling out all the other hurt boxes or collision issues I run into, but I won't spend this much time on them. I've said my piece. Anyway, like I said earlier, it only took two attempts to bring down Renala for good. I may have found myself overleveled for the Red Wolf, but I think it was perfect here. I ended the fight with just one flask remaining and a lot of stress from running for my life from all of the summoned enemies. Time to beat, 24 minutes and 20 seconds. With another shard bearer defeated, I've unlocked the third talisman slot. Green Dog and Blessed Dew have been my mainstays, and now it's time to add the Ritual Sword for just a little bit of that extra damage. It really is just a little bit, and is unreliable because of the max health requirement, but every little bit helps, especially as we enter this next portion of the game where every boss has over 10,000 health. I think of it this way, if I hit 500 rolls with the buff active, uh, that can save me up to 50 rolls. I think it makes a real difference. Up until now, things have been relatively tame, at least as tame as could be expected for something this miserable. From here on, it gets so, so much worse. Don't worry though, by now I'm in too deep and I'm never gonna give it up. I won't ever let you down, but I will run around Landil and hurt this next boss. You might laugh, but across all my playthroughs, I unironically believe that the Draconic Tree Sentinel outside of Lindell has one of the tougher movesets out of all the bosses in this entire game, especially at the point in which you fight it. There's a few reasons for this. First, this arena is lousy. The Sentinel has a habit of bouncing away from you to build distance, and the landscape funnels up the hill towards some stairs and the entrance to the city. Unfortunately, the sides of the funnels are strewn with rocks, and the area next to the stairs just doesn't have enough space to fight safely. Since this guy hits like a truck and has a pretty wide area of effect on some of his attacks, it's extremely risky to fight next to the walls where your movement is limited and can also be hamstrung by the rocks. Second, he spams his dragon horse things fireball quite a lot, most often in pairs. This is his go-to flask input read punish, so you can't rely on distance as an indicator for when you can flask or cast a spell. This fireball also has a nicely sized explosion, so if he shoots it down at your feet or it hits a wall or a rock behind you, you're gonna take a hit unless you dodged pretty late. Third, his lightning strike has one of the most narrow dodge windows out of just about any attack in this entire game, and I'm struggling to think of any that are quite as tight as this one is. I think it's because this isn't just one lightning strike, but rather it's three lightning strikes in quick succession, which is probably also the reason why it does so much damage if it hits you directly. I'm sure you fought this guy and you thought you'd dodge this lightning a few times just to get hit by it anyway. Quick tip, as soon as you see the shield coming down while he's winding this one up, dodge. That's my cue at least. And finally, all the splash damage on his swings is a little bit unintuitive. It can take a while to really get used to the wide range that it has, which gets even more dangerous and more ambiguous when he enters his lightning phase, and it's capped off by his ultimate lightning swing attack, which has a huge area of effect and can be kind of difficult to figure out exactly how to avoid. 
Individually, none of this is too crazy, but for a boss clad in so much heavy armor, he doesn't give you as much time to breathe as you might think he would. He strings it all together really quickly with his fireball attacks, so the onslaught can feel relentless. From my shield hero run, I found that I had a really nice window to attack him as the fight began, so I decided to go in by stacking as many buffs as I could. Golden Vow for 15%, Flame grant me strength for another 20, and my new Talisman for yet another 10. These all stack multiplicatively, making me do 24 damage per roll instead of the measly 16 damage per roll I get without buffs. It doesn't take long for the flame buff to wear off, leaving me at 20 damage per roll while healthy, and then not long after, the vow wears off, leaving me flaccid and sad. That means my damage per second is pretty front-loaded for this fight, and I've got a long fight ahead. Oh boy. Even though this guy's moveset is extremely dangerous and tough to manage, the one saving grace is his shield side. His shield attacks are extremely slow and predictable, and very easy to punish as a result. I spent most of my time trying to dodge through his fireballs and around his hammer swings to reach his shield and unload, at least as best as I could unload. His health might be really high with some crazy high defense, but his aggression forces me to be just as aggressive as he is, so the fight didn't last quite as long as you might think. Once I got consistent enough to avoid a lot of his damage, I finally was able to get him down. Time to beat? 23 minutes and 30 seconds. Alright, this is starting to get exhausting. At this point, I started to channel everyone's favorite infomercial cliche and thought, there's gotta be a better way, man. So I dove into more research, desperate to find anything that can help, and that's when I found this comment on the Briar Armor Set's wiki page. You can pause to read it if you want, but basically it implies that rolling can build up status as long as you're using a weapon that builds up that status. Even though I really didn't want to have anything in my hands for this run, I decided to put it to the test. I grabbed a Spike Cestus, 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 I don't know how to say that word weapon from the merchant and Caled and rolled into this troll outside of Godric's arena until it died. No bleed. I enchanted it with frost and tried again, and nothing. I even called up D-Pad Gamer to help me test it definitively in PvP, since it'll help me confirm if any status builds at all, and still nothing. So that was a bust. I guess that means it's time to head back to the capital, take a quick tour through the city, and meet up with Godfrey's ghost. Godfrey's Shade is a really interesting fight. His moveset is pretty limited, and he tends to get caught up in an aggressive and repetitive loop. I got pretty competent at this fight during my shield hero run, so I knew what I was getting into. Despite that, he's still pretty dangerous and can drop you in a combo if you're too reckless, so the fight can get pretty tiring. I'm still using the same three talismans here, and would cast Golden Vow before entering. With these long fights, even the superior 90 seconds of the Golden Vow is no match for the attrition that these fights represent. But I would still take the time to bait Godfrey into an axe throw to re-up it while I had the resources, making my 16 damage roll turn into 18. Not saving a lot of time with these overall, but it does allow me to break up the monotony a bit and get a small rest before diving back in. I got him down in about 5 attempts, but I almost got him on my third. You. An important lesson in patience and roll safety. I was out of flasks and got anxious and greedy and it got me killed. He does have some stanky hurt boxes, not nearly as bad as Renala, but enough where I noticed and probably lengthened the fight by a minute or two. Time to beat, 12 minutes and 20 seconds. Godfrey's ghost may not have been that bad, but I didn't really expect him to be. Like I said, I learned him pretty well during my shield hero run, and a lot of that is still fresh enough in my mind, so I didn't have much learning left to do to defeat him. But this next boss was a major wall for me in that run, and even after I beat him in that one, I was not confident in my ability to beat him again. And so again, I thought, there's gotta be something I'm missing for damage, right? Something, anything. With the death of the Golden Ghost of Godfrey, we've unlocked our final talisman slot, and we don't really have anything to put in it. I thought that maybe, just maybe, the Briar Armor has a weird damage classification, so I went to collect the Guard Counter and Jump Attack Talismans to try them out, but neither of them worked. There's also the Winged Insignia Talisman, which is supposed to boost your attack power after multiple successful attacks, 
And I tried that one out during my initial test runs, but since you're not actually attacking, it doesn't work. Oh well crap, it seems that I've really done all I can do as far as offense goes. At least I can beat up Patches to feel better about myself and buy Margit's Shackle from him for as much good as that'll do. As a consolation prize, I went to collect the Crimson Seed Talisman to increase the amount that my flasks heal, and since I have no weapons and rolling doesn't take too much stamina, there's not much else to dump my stats in other than vigor, so at least this is a worthwhile pickup for those emergency situations. Next boss. Pillagers, emboldened by the flame of ambition. Have it writ upon thy meager grave. Felled by King Morgoth, last of all kings. I mentioned this earlier, but when it comes to a run like this, knowledge is power. Fights are exhaustingly long, and you only get so many flasks to make up for your mistakes. Problem is, while I had to learn Morgoth well enough to beat him with a shield, I never truly got good at fighting him. His constant spinning and wide strikes just never really clicked in my mind, so he's always been a pretty difficult fight for me. As I killed each boss leading up to this point, one thought stuck in my mind. This run is gonna end at Morgoth. There's no way I can beat him. Still, I had to try. The Green Dog, Blessed Dew, Ritual Sword, and Crimson Seed Talismans are my friends for this fight, and the initial runs, well, they didn't look so hot. Merely 15 minutes and four deaths later, and I was already feeling demoralized. But I'm not as equipped as I could be, so it's time for a little detour. I head back to my favorite farming spot for a few more levels and some extra health and defense, and took a small world tour to collect a lot of golden seeds that I missed. Now I'm level 90 with two extra flasks, so hopefully that'll help a ton. Back to Morgoth, I began starting the fight by casting both of my buffs, which when combined with Margit's Shackle, which I can only use two times by the way, lets me do a nice bit of damage at the front of the fight. Fully buffed, my damage goes from 17 to a whopping 26, or 24 if I get hit, which is pretty nice since he can't answer my aggression while he's taking a quick nap. Eventually, all these buffs fall off, so I'm stuck at 17 or 19 depending on my health for the rest of the fight, but speeding up the early part of this encounter is still pretty nice. These next rounds go significantly better, and 9 minutes into my final attempt for the night, this happens. Oh, that's phase 2, baby! Things are looking up, but... There's still a long, long way to go before this even begins to look possible for me. I've been talking about this challenge to the members of my Discord community, and at around this time, Blake Dude asks, What about bestial vitality? Huh, I didn't even know that spell existed. My original plan was to eventually reach 38 faith so I can use the incantation collected from the Queen's bedchamber right before this fight. Blessing of the Erd Tree. This incantation costs a whopping 60 FP and regenerates 12 health per second for 90 seconds, for a total heal of 1080. Pretty chunky heal, but extremely expensive in both stats and resources. On the other hand, Bestial Vitality requires only 12 faith and uses only 18 FP, while healing only 5 per second for 2 whole minutes for a total of 600 health. This seems like a really garbage spell for any normal playthrough, but this isn't any normal playthrough. Fights that last dozens of minutes like these do requires that I not get hit for long periods of time. And with Bestial Vitality being so cheap and so efficient and so relatively quick to cast, I can easily get a lot of these off during a fight, provided there's a large enough opening for it. And remember, that's all on top of the regeneration that I already get from my talisman, so it should all add up pretty nicely over time. This could be it. This could be the sauce that I need to sweeten my rolls. This could be the secret ingredient that turns my gross, cheap grocery store rolls into a nice King's Hawaiian. So it's time for another detour. You can get Bestial Vitality from the Bestial Sanctum. The only catch is that you need three death root. At this point in the game, I should be able to beat enough early bosses, even with just rolling, to meet this requirement. First one comes from a Tibia Mariner in Summonwater Village, west of Kalid, the same place that I found my green dog talisman. 
The second one I found in the Death Touched Catacombs in Stormhill, guarded by a Black Knife assassin, and the final one came from another Tibia Mariner in Liernia. It only took about 20 minutes to get what I needed, and the spell casts much faster than I expected it to. Very nice. And with this in my possession, I decided to make sure to start dumping a few more levels into mind so I can get 10 casts of this off before needing to flask. And while I was at it, I also went to the minor Erd tree on the Weeping Peninsula for the Crimson Burst Crystal Tier. Up until now, I was using Crimson Crystal Tier for a 50% heal and a Green Spill Crystal Tier for more maximum stamina, but stamina hasn't really been an issue for me for a long time now, so this is a good opportunity to replace it. The Crimson Burst grants 7 health per second for 3 minutes, which is better than Bestial Vitality on both counts. It doesn't stack with Bestial Vitality, but getting a nice heal over time on top of a flat 50% heal can come in pretty clutch during emergencies. And with that, I got back to work. As I went into the next session of attempts, over the first half of the hour, I still wasn't feeling too confident. I was able to see Phase 2 more reliably, but I was still getting caught by moves I had no idea how to read. But on my final attempt of the night, I got this run. It doesn't seem like much, but this was the best I had done so far. My fights were beginning to last longer, I was learning the nuances of how Morgoth moves and how he chooses to attack, and what combos he likes. It wasn't enough just yet, but I was learning. I was getting better. There was hope. It's amazing what a good night's sleep can do for you. What seemed impossible yesterday is suddenly within your grasp as your brain processes the information it learned throughout the previous day. The next day, I launched the game, and Morgoth was dead on my second attempt of that day. Please pardon the choppiness of this footage. I was streaming to a friend at the same time as I was recording, and the recording really didn't seem to like it. But I was doing well. I had learned. I suddenly knew how to avoid this spinning hammer attack. I figured out the dodge timing for when he bounces away with a quick slash, and it's now part of my muscle memory. My confidence still wasn't terribly high but it felt more possible than ever, and he finally, finally went down. Everything before Morgoth was difficult, but this is the first boss that spanned multiple days worth of attempts. Only three hours over three days in between my other responsibilities, but it felt like so much longer. But the run lives on, for now. Shoutouts to Blake Dude for the bestial vitality idea. Time to beat, 34 minutes and 20 seconds, jeez. Alright, so we're finally approaching endgame. With the mountaintop of the giants now accessible, we can finally max out our flask's healing potential and grab a few more seeds for a nice little stack of 13 total flasks. There's a flame drake talisman plus one just laying on the ground on the way out of the city too, which is really convenient since the plus two talisman is way too difficult to grab because it requires beating this pair of beastmen at the bottom of a cave in Kaled. It may have been possible, but between the melee guy rushing me down and the ranged guy constantly running away from me while chucking projectiles, it didn't feel worth my time. At least we have the plus one, because we're definitely going to need it for this next guy. I may have been worried about Morgoth, but I knew that things were only going to get worse. Unfortunately for me, worse came immediately. Let me introduce you to the only boss who rolls more than I do. If I were to make a tier list of how worried I was about each boss in this run, the Fire Giant would sit comfortably in S tier alongside the very last boss of the game. I'm going to bring the stats back up as I talk because this boss has the most complicated stat block of this entire video. The Fire Giant is a very tough enemy with extremely high defense, except for a few weak spots on his body. So for each phase, it'll take different amounts of damage depending on where you strike it. For the entirety of the first phase, including what I like to call phase 1.5, this weak point is at the target lock spot on his ankle. 
the rolls to kill stat has changed slightly to the rolls to phase stat, indicating how many rolls it'll take to defeat this phase of the boss. The range is high just to be true to the math, but in reality, during these first phases we'll be striking the weak spot with nearly 100% consistency, so you can assume that the actual RTP value is going to be closer to the lower end of the range. This is the point of the run where I stopped worrying about my buff spells, Golden Vow, and Flame grant me strength. They're nice boosts, but the duration is so fleeting that I decided that they weren't worth my precious FP anymore. Especially considering how invaluable bestial vitality proved for these wars of attrition. I also decided to retire my green dog talisman since stamina doesn't really seem to be an issue anymore, and put the flame drake talisman plus one in its place to protect myself from burning. You'd think that with as much as I'm rolling, I'd have an increased resistance to fire damage, but unfortunately the game doesn't work that way. Anyway, phase one of the fire giant isn't much of a problem. This portion of the fight just teaches you all about its non-fire attacks, all of which look scary and do hit pretty hard, but are actually pretty easy to dodge once you get used to the tells. As long as you're not getting unlucky with the terrain and the camera doesn't go too crazy, you have all the information you need to properly dodge just by using the giant's feet and his screaming voice as he attacks. It just takes one, maybe two tries to recalibrate, and the next phase is unlocked. The beginning of phase one can be considered more of a prologue or a tutorial to the real fight which actually begins here. All of the fire giant's moves are dangerous, but his shield attacks are extremely easy to dodge. Occasionally you'll get hit by a swipe you didn't see coming, but even that can be dodged with plenty of consistency after a little bit of practice. But beginning with this phase, he also gains access to an arsenal of fire spells, all of which are extremely dangerous and change the fight in difficult and painful ways. The fireballs are extremely annoying. If you're on your horse, you can just run perpendicular from the fire giant and they'll miss every time. But if you're on foot, you're going to have to dodge manually. Their flight pattern is a little strange, though starting slow and speeding up, ending in a rather large explosion right at your feet, so dodging is much easier said than done. Not impossible to get good at, but a major source of stress, since every hit adds up in a fight like this. So if I'm ever at a significant distance from this boss, I'll want to hop on Torrent, not just to close the distance, but to mitigate the danger of this attack. The next fire attack to watch out for is just as annoying, but not quite as easy to deal with. He'll summon these magma orbs that slowly follow you. Once they get close, they'll explode and leave a damaging area of effect on the ground. These get in the way, and he likes to summon them a lot, and he also likes to summon them off camera, which means you'll have to get really good at intuiting where they are, the sounds they make, and how to avoid them. These slow the fight down a lot, because they'll often force you to run away from the fire giant for safety. You'll want to go out of your way to detonate these as soon as you safely can, just so they don't blindside you later. His last fire attack summons a field of flame pillars, and all you gotta do here is run away from them and you'll be fine. You really don't want to get hit by this attack, but it wasn't too long before I realized that there is always a safe spot between the pillars. I'd unlock my camera and focus on the ground to find a safe spot and wait it out so I wouldn't have to run away from the fire giant anymore and save some precious minutes. After about an hour's worth of attempts, I was getting pretty comfortable with dodging just enough of the fire giant's attacks that I was happy with letting bestial vitality and my blessed dew talisman top me off if I ever got clipped. At this point, the flasks became more of a mistake counter. If I took too much damage too quickly, I would use a flask. Otherwise, I'd just let the regeneration do its work. This fight is way too long to use them every time I got run over, and I'm going to want as many as possible for Phase 2. And deep into my second hour of attempts, we finally see Phase 2 for the first time. Phase 2 of the Fire Giant is horrifying. Cool as hell, but horrifying. 
At this point, he's almost a completely different boss. He can no longer walk around, all of the attacks introduced in the first phase are now gone, and in its place he has a few new attacks with his arm, a new combat roll that becomes his absolute favorite move, and his fire attacks become way more dangerous. The fireball now gets shot twice, once from each hand. Dodging them manually is much harder, but Torrent still dodges them for free. He now summons two magma orbs at the same time for double the threat, and his stomach mouth thing can now belch all kinds of fire. His defenses also change significantly. His weak points are now on his eye, which is completely out of reach for me, and his arms, which are only available when the giant says they are. You're free to hit him on his remaining leg all you want where it's the safest, but this is also where his defenses are the highest. All conventional wisdom says to avoid fighting him from the front at all costs, since that's the most dangerous place to be. He can swing wildly with his arms, puke fire right on top of you, drop meteors in your area, and shoot all sorts of fire from his hands if you're in front of him. During this first attempt, I tried to ignore the conventional wisdom and got severely punished, so I guess I'll just be tickling his foot to death. It's only gonna take, um, 1800 rolls. Okay, before I commit to that, I, I want to take a small break. My farming spot has lost some of its appeal by now, but it's still by far the best place that I've got. But I can definitely sweeten the pot a little bit. I took another attempt at collecting the Golden Scarab Talisman, and to my surprise, I managed to kill the Clean Rot duo at the bottom of the abandoned cave. They don't hit too hard since I'm a much higher level than I was last time, but they're still pretty scary. Next, I committed some atrocities against the local bird population for their feet and crafted a bunch of golden fowl feet and got to work. By now, I've gotten good enough at maneuvering through these sad boys that I can awaken the whole colony at once and get two cycles per foul foot. Before too long, I have enough runes to reach level 112, and I finally put into practice one more suggestion that Blake Dude gave me on Discord that I've been resisting. I grabbed the Icon Shield from the Altus Plateau. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. Aren't shields illegal? Well, technically no. As long as I don't use it to attack or block, we're still good, right? I don't want it for those functions anyway. I want it for the passive 3 health regeneration that it grants while equipped giving me a total of 5 passive health regeneration when paired with my talisman. This is like having bestial vigor on permanently, and casting that spell will double my regeneration for the duration. Again, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's just enough to make my passive regeneration over the course of these excruciatingly long fights much, much more noticeable and powerful. I'm a little sad though, I really, really didn't want to resort to this since the shield clashes with my armor in a bad way, but it's a small sacrifice to make to keep the run going. Back to the fire giant, this shield immediately pays off. Fast forwarding just a tiny bit, you can see just how much health I regain over time without even using bestial vitality. And that'll help me save resources in the long term. The biggest wall blocking me from victory here is phase two. I simply don't understand it well enough yet, but to understand it, I gotta face it. That means spending the 40 minutes it takes just to reach phase two, just for the opportunity to learn what it can do. I mentioned this in my shield hero run, but part of what makes this fight so long is just how terribly suited this arena is for a fight like this. The fire giant moves around a lot with a lot of his attacks, and he'll cover a lot of ground very quickly. You'll often find him backing himself into the cliffside or onto some very rocky terrain. It's usually not a huge deal when you're running a real build that can do real damage from a real range, but we don't have any of those luxuries right now. My damage is pathetic and my range is basically negative, so if the giant plants his ankle on a slightly elevated rock or a tree trunk, it becomes extremely difficult to hit until he chooses to move it. And his tendency to back into walls and cliffs is extremely frustrating since those act as limiters for my own movement and an extra danger of just running into a wall or falling down a cliff. It also makes the fire giant's own movements much less predictable as he slides into an invisible wall with his rolls and his attacks. It sucks to get hit by a roll that would otherwise not hit you just because he had nowhere else to go, so he just slid along in place. Kinda dumb, but nothing we can't manage, with a little extra time at least. I ended up mitigating this danger by just fleeing to the other side of the map. With enough range, he simply stops attacking and slowly walks towards me, allowing me to reposition him away from any dangerous area that he happens to land on. 
It's not insurmountable, but it's definitely an annoying quirk that slows down the fight more than his immense health pull already does. This is a big problem in Phase 2 as well, where he even managed to get himself stuck on this small cliff, wasting a bunch of time and causing a lot of anxiety. All that's to say, each failure is extremely costly, and if I die in Phase 2 before learning anything about it, it's a very long and very wasted run. I took a brief look at the boss guides and video tutorials on YouTube just to try and accelerate my learning, and they did help a little bit, but experience is the king of learning, so I'm in for a long, long struggle here. Plus, it seems like every single guide recommends avoiding the front and attacking from the back with torrents, so they didn't really give me any tips that I didn't already know or could even use. So it's all on me. Even though I've gotten really good at avoiding the fire giant's attacks, I'm still not perfect. The longer these fights get, the more mentally exhausting they are, the more liable I am to make a mistake that spirals out of control, and the higher the chance that the boss lands itself in a very difficult part of the arena to fight. Combine that with my general worry that if I use too many flasks in Phase 1, that I have no hope of beating Phase 2, and most of my attempts are dead before I even reach the truly hard part of this fight. At the end of my fourth hour of attempts, I finally reached Phase 2 again, when this happened. I barely heard him. I didn't even know that that attack exists. But at least I do now and can know how to avoid it for whenever I see that wind up again. This is the one attack where YouTube actually helped. All you gotta do is run circles and you're mostly safe. Another hour later and I get another shot and... Well, that's embarrassing. I just completely failed at steering my horse here and died immediately. Oh, well, crap. But at this point, I had spent another couple collective hours on the first phases, so I was getting stronger, more prepared, more consistent. And this next attempt, as we rolled into the sixth hour of this fire giant frenzy, I was on an extremely promising run. My strategy here was slow and excruciating, but it was working, and that's all I could ask for. I'd run behind the boss, do damage until it rolls away, and then hop on torrent to deal with anything that the boss wants to throw at me and make my way behind the boss again. And repeated this for what feels like hundreds of iterations. Occasionally I'd book it to the other side of the arena to reposition the boss just like before and continue the grind. As long as you're behind his back foot, his roll will never hurt you, and I learned that the best way to deal with the magma orbs was to run between them and set them off as soon as they came out. I was on a roll. This was it. This was the run where the fire giant dies. Wait, wait, no, what's, what's happening? You wanna see me do it again? Oh no, it took an hour and a half just to make it this far. Oh. That hurts. This strategy really looked solid for a while there, but it just takes forever. Other than the pitiful damage that I do to his foot, the distance I make with Torrent means that the giant gets more opportunities to use his long range attacks. I can avoid most of them, but not all of them, and that becomes a major problem for keeping my horse alive. I lost Torrent a few times during this fight, and of course each loss meant a loss of a flask to get the horse back. Until I wasn't willing to spend any more flasks on revival, which led into me getting destroyed by a double, double fireball. I needed a new strategy. I needed to learn the impossible. I needed to do what no other player has ever bothered to try. I needed to learn how to fight the fire giant from the front and take advantage of its weak wrists. Of course, I'm exaggerating here, surely there's someone out there who has fought the fire giant in this way, but you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who does this on YouTube unless you already know where to look. I tried, but like I mentioned before, every person I found suggested staying on your horse and tickling the giant's feet, or foot. I'm not prepared to spend another hour and a half like this, so I needed to evolve. Much to my surprise, this way of fighting the fire giant is <laughs> its actually extremely easy. Approaching the giant from the front after he rolls will, more often than not, 
bait him into attacking with his arms. These arm attacks are extremely easy to dodge and always result in an opening that's just long enough to get in more damage than I could manage at his feet. More importantly, these attacks almost always come in pairs before he'll roll away again, making it pretty easy to get anywhere from 1 to 300 damage per cycle. On top of that, once you determine the boss's roll direction, you can immediately start running in that direction and be in a really solid position to deal with his next melee attacks or one of his fire spells. This approach also has a pretty good chance of baiting him into a melee combo, which is exactly what we want. Approaching on foot like this is also much safer than you'd think. His extremely dangerous fireballs have a minimum range, so as long as you keep running towards him, you'll have a much easier time dodging. And his magma orbs take so long for him to cast, and so long for him to recover from, that it's pretty trivial to adopt a zigzag pattern to trigger their explosion, and then run underneath him to wait for him to roll and continue the cycles. He'll never begin his long-range flamethrower if you're close, so the only other attack to watch out for is his fire vomit, which turns out to be extremely easy to avoid just by running away from underneath him. If he does get far enough away for a flamethrower, like I said before, a perpendicular run will almost always keep you safe. This is it. This is the best strategy to clutch out this victory. I've done so much damage in a fraction of the time it took before, and I've managed to avoid so much damage myself that I'm sitting comfortably on nine healing flasks and haven't even used my FP flask yet. It's just a matter of time now. Victory is as good as my- What? The- Why? What? 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 No. Oh my god. No way. No freaking way. Every single guide I watched and every fight I've experienced up until now told me that avoiding this meteor attack is as easy as staying underneath and behind him. Intuitively, these rocks shouldn't even be able to pass through the boss, and he leans back to do this attack, so it, it just makes sense to use him as shelter, right? Nope. Not only is it not nearly as safe as I believed it was, but I got extremely unlucky in the moment for two of these exploding rocks to land right next to where I was rolling at the same time, destroying me immediately from full health. What? The hell, man. As painful as that was, though, uh, I was right. That was the best strategy for this fight, and victory was just a matter of time and patience at this point. Despite the mental damage I received from that last defeat, I managed to squeeze out the victory after a total of around nine and a half hours of attempts over four days. This whole run was a journey, but this boss was its own journey. Time to beat? One hour, 21 minutes, and 20 seconds. Total rolls to kill? 1,622 to 3,293. But since I was able to hit this boss's weak point for a vast majority of my damage, and stayed at max health for a significant portion of the fight, we can probably say that this was closer to around 18 or 1900. It's a far cry from 3,000, but still an extremely high amount. With the boss with the highest health pull in the game finally defeated, it's time to burn the Erd Tree and wake up in Faramazula. Part of me was convinced that I would never, ever beat the Fire Giant and that I'd have to wrong warp here to continue the run, uh, but luckily we made it here legitimately. Up next, though, is the worst required boss in the game, and I am not looking forward to it. This is the Godskin Duo. I don't think it's controversial to claim that this is the worst boss in the game, at least on the required path. This boss has a surprising amount of health, and I never managed to get really good at fighting even one of these guys very safely. 
Both of them constantly chase you down, but the fat one, the noble, likes to speed up and close the distance, which means that he's going to be our target for this fight. This really wasn't going well. After about 45 minutes of attempts, my best run only managed to deal about 10 to 15% of the boss's total health in just under 15 minutes. This fight is extremely chaotic and worse, extremely boring at the same time. For safety, I would just run around these pillars until I managed to separate the two enemies and roll into the big guy until I felt it wasn't safe anymore. Phase 1 of the Noble is pretty easy to react to and dodge, so I managed to get him to Phase 2 a couple times where I wouldn't last very long. His combos become quite a bit faster, much harder to read, and significantly more dangerous, and that's on top of his sonic side B attack and the skinny guy being rude from a distance. Lucky for me, I had a new strategy in mind. I like to watch speedruns, and I don't like this boss. So it's time for a little bit of disrespect. Remember my rules, even though I want to do this run as legitimately as possible, I didn't rule out cheese or glitches entirely. So it's time for me to learn a new trick. A couple of YouTube videos later and I managed to beat the Godskin duo. Time to beat. That trick is called a zip. It's extremely precise and extremely inconsistent to pull off, so I was really happy that I managed to do it. Hopefully nobody minds me completely disrespecting the Godskin duo for this run. Uh, despite the patience that I had shown for the Fire Giant, I didn't have the patience for the duo. Too much running around waiting for a modicum of safety, too much chaos, too much health, and I never felt like I was learning anything or building confidence in the boss, so it's off to greener pastures. We're skipping the Tree Sentinel in front of this next boss. It's not really worth fighting. Uh, so let's just run past him and meet my next wall. This is Malekith, whose phase one is disguised as a beast clergyman. The first thing I noticed here is that his health is actually rather low, much lower than the Godskin duo, but his defense is quite a bit higher and I'm dealing an extremely pathetic 10 damage per roll, which does not change between phases, which also means that this will be another long fight. I've never had a super easy time fighting this boss and phase two has always been majorly difficult for me so I'm already pretty comfortable with fighting Phase 1 safely. On only my second attempt, after dealing about 45% of his health and damage, the real fight begins. Oh, well, that went extremely well, didn't it? So I'm feeling just a little bit underleveled here, at least for this challenge. Unfortunately, even with my new talisman and my stash of golden foul feet, my favorite farming spot isn't very lucrative anymore. But after a little bit of further research, I found something even better. Using my years of Kaizo Mario experience, I'm able to use Torrent to parkour up this cliff face near my farming spot and throw myself off a cliff out of bounds. You're not supposed to be able to get up here, so there aren't any death planes out here. And after about a minute of falling and swinging my fist to reset the fall timer, everything in the area dies for an extremely easy 160,000 runes. From there, I would just teleport back to the Grace and repeat for a full episode of my rewatch of Jessica Jones, and I have 5 million runes to reach level 155. This is what 99 Vigor looks like, by the way. It's good, but it's not great. Going from 60 Vigor to 99 is only worth about 200 extra health, and the extra levels aren't increasing my defense by much anymore, uh, but I guess every little bit helps. With that done, maybe we'll have a better chance against the world's most dangerous dog. Uh, nope. 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 Nope, not even not even close. I can barely survive two hits here. Normally I'd put on some beefier armor to increase my defense, but that's not really an option. The Briar armor is decent, but it's no tree sentinel armor, that's for sure. So after weighing my options, I decided to try and make my way to the Halig Tree to collect the best defense talisman in the game, the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. I try to collect this in all of my runs, but because of how difficult it is just to kill any boss in this run, I've been avoiding it. But it seems way too good to pass up at this point. Luckily, I have a few tricks in my pocket to help us get there. First, I make my way back to the mountaintop of the giants and make my way to Castle Soul. 
Uh, but we're not going in. You think I'm gonna kill Commander Nial like this? <laughs> yeah, right. Instead, I head up the path, line myself up, and end my life in the most efficient way possible. This jump is a little bit tricky, but if done just right, you'll die near a stake of Merica at the bottom of the cliff and can skip the Halig Tree medallions completely. No Nial needed. I grab a golden seed for free and light some statues and make my way to the Halig Tree, then down some branches, past some snails and zombies and mages, and unlock the shortcut in front of Loretta's boss fight. I give her a few solid attempts, but I really have no interest in fighting her. The fight seems doable, if annoying, but I'm not here for Loretta. I just need to get past her. Unfortunately, the only documented way I could find of skipping her fight has been patched out, so I need to get a little bit creative. The zip is a really interesting glitch. There's a few great videos detailing just exactly how it works, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. But when you pull one off correctly, you'll go flying forward in a straight line. Conveniently, you can use the terrain around the world to help direct the zip in different trajectories. To help direct the zip in different trajectories. Tra 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 trajectories. 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 Conveniently, you can use the terrain around the world to help direct the zip in different trajectories for some really interesting and useful results, which we'll see in just a minute. But first, I have to get into the arena, which proves difficult since the zip is heavily dependent on a stable 60 frames per second. And while my machine is pretty good, it's not super great. Looking up or down to lower the amount of junk my computer has to render helps a lot though. Also, getting the exact timing down, even with a metronome, is extremely tough, and if I take too long, these battle mages will make things difficult. So I do what any good programmer does. I work smarter, not harder. I looked up the exact frame timings that make the trick work, and made a quick little macro in my Logitech software, and now, with the press of a single button, all the inputs are done automatically, with consistent, perfect precision. This still doesn't work 100% of the time, but it's good enough for my uses, and before long, I'm in Loretta's arena. The next trick is to get out, which is easier said than done. This arena is extremely flat, with fences that are way too high to climb over, and nothing to help me reach them. Luckily, there is a very, very small bump in this part of the arena that might do the trick. I line myself up to launch off this bump, aim for the tree in hopes that it will stop my movement, and with any luck, I'll zip right over the fence and to my destination and... Wait, that that's not right, but this is probably even better. Chances are that if this fence had not caught me, I'd have slid past the tree into my death. But one careful run and jump later, and I'm past Loretta and down to the brace of the Halig tree. All that's left is a quick elevator skip and some spooky backtracking to the top of this church and the Dragon Crest Great Shield talisman is mine for the taking. That was a fun little detour. This talisman adds another 15% to my total damage negation, which will go a long way for my survivability against Malaketh and beyond. But while I'm down here, I might as well visit Melania. Uh, this fight was kind of funny. I only did 14 or 16 damage per roll, depending on my health, and I couldn't get enough damage in to make it so that a single hit from her wouldn't completely erase all my progress. I danced with her for around five minutes before I got bored and just let her kill me. I would be extremely impressed if anyone decided to beat Melania in this way. Uh, but I'm definitely not gonna bother. Anyway, time to go find our last golden seed for maximum flasks and head back to Malaketh. And with the added benefit of my new talisman, I was surviving long enough to learn how to survive long enough to win. I was a little worried that I would run into some similar hurt box issues and collision issues that I did during my shield hero run, but luckily, I don't have any slow animations to deal with and my attacks are basically instantaneous, so there's no risk of Malaketh pushing me out of the way while I try to attack. And since I don't have the luxury of the blasphemous claw to slow him down, I didn't have to deal with the janky collision issues that it introduced. It was just me and the full force of Malaketh's anime superpowers. With all of these attempts at Malaketh, I managed to master the Beast Clergyman phase even more than I thought possible. The first handful of attempts took 25 minutes to get through the first phase, but by this point in my Malaketh journey, I found ways to optimize this portion of the fight down to a mere 15 minutes by changing my rolling patterns to hit more often, learning how to bait certain attacks, and staying so aggressive that he would cast his Stonefield spell way less often. Sure, it was a little bit frustrating, frustrating to fight this guy so often with how easy he was, but by now I've crossed the threshold of being annoyed and transcended to zen. 
turning my brain off and letting the muscle memory and the trained Pavlovian responses carry me forward. These fights are taking forever, but even as far back as Morgoth, the time just kind of flew by with dozens of minutes melting in the intense focus of the call and response action that I'm stuck in. It's oddly meditative, and dare I say, fun in its own twisted way. Malekith is such an insane and dangerous boss, and he always seemed too quick and too dangerous for me to ever understand, but even Malekith was no match for the power of time and study, and eventually his speed was nothing compared to my preparation. With the exception of this flurry attack, I knew how to properly respond to everything now, even if I still occasionally mistimed a roll and got punished for it. And soon enough, Malekith was down as well. Malekith wasn't nearly as difficult of a wall as the fire giant was, but he was still extremely scary. It took me four hours and 20 minutes, nice, over the course of two days to finally take him out. Time to beat, 35 minutes and 40 seconds. Okay, this is awesome. With two of the most difficult bosses this game has to offer killed in this ridiculous run, my confidence is at an all-time high. Walls have been torn down, cities have been buried in ash, and total victory is nigh. It's gonna be pretty nice to bully one of the easiest endgame bosses. Gideon is a joke, and with this Briar armor, I can just stagger him out of all of his casts for free and move on with my la- Wait, Gideon isn't staggering. Why isn't Gideon staggering? Uh-oh. I'm gonna level with you here. I spent no more than 10 minutes on Gideon, even less than I did on the Godskin duo, and he does not seem possible with this build. This man spams spells like they're going out of style, and to top it off, he tries to keep up his explosion defensive spell at all costs, which is extremely damaging and extremely hard to predict when it'll actually go off. He's hard to approach for any melee build, but at least melee has the benefit of staggering him out of casts and, you know, damage. And for me, he just powers through it and punishes me with a billion damage worth of comets and rings of light. A single comet obliterates like one third of my health in an instant, and he just machine guns it with glint blades active and rings of light flying everywhere, and I legitimately don't know how I'm supposed to survive for long enough to just chip him to death. Unfortunately, patch 1.0.4 seems to have patched out the only known way to skip this guy by adding a brutal invisible wall to this tree trunk. So if I want to skip this guy, it's up to me to find a way to do it. I want to try zips, but what sucks is that the grace between Gideon and the next boss is in a very inconvenient spot to reach with this glitch. The unrestricted any percent speedrun category uses a very specific spot to get into Godfrey's arena, but it seems impossible to get out. I did my best to aim at the roof of the Queen's bedchambers from the stairway leading to the Elden Tree, but any angle that would get me there just wouldn't work. I'd either zip way too far, or just nowhere at all. I did manage to land on the fence next to the fog gate, but there seems to be a massive invisible wall surrounding the entire arena that I couldn't find any way to get over. I spent a couple of hours trying various things and wandering around the city trying to find any spot that could get me where I wanted to go, but the city's geometry is so chaotic and so complex that I often wound up far outside the city in the wrong direction, and I was about ready to give up. There was one thing I hadn't tried yet, though zipping through Gideon's arena itself. Gideon's arena is mostly flat, but there are a few very small staircases that aren't even worth paying attention to under normal circumstances. It was my hope that I could use these stairs to launch me up towards the rafters at the top of the arena and Hey, it worked. I got really lucky and pulled this off on my first try while I wasn't recording, unfortunately. But I did manage to reproduce it with a little more effort, and here you can see it happen. My macro came in pretty clutch here, and even though Gideon tried to be super annoying and succeeded, he was no match for the power of my glitches. Another boss that I hope people don't mind that I've disrespected. Luckily, the fog gates at the top of the door have no collision, and the way out doesn't even have a fog gate at all, so with Gideon successfully pacified, it's time to move on to the next boss. Upon my name as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. Godfrey is a bit of a silly boss. If you've mastered the Golden Shade, you're not going to have too much trouble here. The moves are mostly the same, but he seems to mix up and extend his combos a little bit more. The major addition is that after doing a little bit of damage to him, he'll add in his Earth Cleave attack, 
Normally I'd find this a little bit annoying, but since it's so easy to avoid, I really appreciated its existence because it gave me time to breathe a bit and cast Bestial Vitality. He also gets way more aggressive, opting to dash towards you instead of walk around the same time that this ability is unlocked. Otherwise, the fight is pretty straightforward and very familiar. He does evolve his little Earthquake Stomp into a Shockwave Stomp that hits the whole arena instead of just in front of him, but it doesn't really change the dodge or jump timings in any significant way and is more of a scare tactic than anything. The only major problem with this portion of the fight is, you guessed it, the same collision and hurtbox issues that existed for his shade. But they seem to be slightly worse. It's probably due to the fact that Godfrey is slightly larger than his shade, exacerbating the issues. Not the worst defender for sure, but enough to extend this phase by a minute or two. Just like Malaketh, the fight truly begins once you reach phase two, but this time after dealing around 55% of his health and damage. Now I fight just horror, Lou. Hora Lu is yet another boss that I never felt truly confident in fighting. His attacks are extremely difficult to read, and they all have extremely weird delays that make dodging this boss's aggression more difficult than most. Like, what is this? Is he frozen? Oh no, he just holds the attack for that long. All that is on top of his three command grabs each with different tells and extremely different methods to avoid. He still has his Earth Cleave attack, but it's evolved into more of a crater and is much more dangerous. Luckily, it's still perfectly timed to let me cast Bestial Vitality and get a little bit of a mental reset. Unfortunately, I don't get to see any of this on my first attempt because he immediately grinds me in the dust. Nice. Things were looking much better on the second attempt, still died, but I lasted long enough to stop my recording and watch it back a couple times to get a better idea about what to look for. Not exciting, but probably saved me a few painful deaths. All that's left now is to grind it out. As I fought Horalu, one thing became apparent. This fight is almost unbearably stressful. I already mentioned his speed and his delayed attack patterns, but the worst part is that he inherits Godfrey's worst attribute a jank collision box. Except here, it's so, so much worse. The best way to avoid Horalu's attacks is to get behind him. He attacks quickly, but his turning speed sucks unless it's an attack that is specifically designed to turn him around. Once you learn those, you're gonna take a lot less damage. Problem is though, his collision box is, by a wide margin, the absolute worst in this entire game. At least for the bosses I cover in this video. Dodging through him, past him, into him, it doesn't matter. A significant portion won't actually hit, despite the fact that you're actually colliding with him on a ton of these rolls. It might not look like it sometimes, but I'm angling my roll on some of these in a way that slides across his collision. This problem is the worst at his back. You know, the safest place to be and retaliate from. His ass is as impenetrable penetrable as it is thick, and I can't say that I'm a fan in this instance. Even though Horalu takes more damage per roll than his phase 1 counterpart, and even though his heavy aggression forces me to match him with my own, and even though this phase has less health than the first, phase 2 took a little over 10 minutes more to beat than phase 1 did. Some of that can be chalked up to his love for screaming, which knocks me out of my aggression, but most of that difference is simply because so many of my hits just didn't. Horalu starts his phases by unevolving his shockwave and going back to a frontal cone earth slam thing. But after a while, he re-evolves it again, and then the fight becomes much more dangerous. You no longer have the luxury of just dodging out of the way of the earth slams, you have to dodge out of the way and with perfect timing as to not get hit by the shockwave or any of his follow-up attacks. The last portion of this fight is incredibly scary and incredibly stressful just because of that. But even with all those troubles, this boss wound up not being too bad as far as the grind goes. After only about three and a half hours of attempts, Horalu was down. It sounds like a lot, but that was only my sixth attempt. That's just how long these fights have gotten. Time to beat, 49 minutes and 15 seconds with 29 of that being just Horalu. Total rolls to kill, 1,421. This is it. We finally made it. 
The only thing standing in my way from becoming the Elden Roll is one last pair of bosses. Oh, and fun fact by the way, both of these next two bosses combined have less health than the Fire Giant did. So let's cross our fingers and this wall of light and end this thing. Radagon is such a cool boss. Probably my second favorite out of all of Elden Ro um, Elden Ring. Sorry. This boss competes with Horalu for the most obnoxiously delayed swings in the game, but his patterns are relatively consistent and easy to follow and learn with plenty of really nice openings to exploit. The way he ramps up over time is really fun and extremely intimidating and dynamic, and you won't even know it's coming until he does something new. He'll start making more of his attacks explode, he'll start double firing his lightning bolts. It even seems like he ramps up his aggression in very subtle ways that I'm not even sure if it's actually happening or not. After knocking about 30% of his health bar, he'll start zipping around with an explosive teleport that is extremely difficult to react to. He's not overly difficult, but Radagon is just go, go, go the whole time with very little room to breathe or rest. Luckily, this move right here exists, and so does this one, both of which are great opportunities to cast Bestial Vitality and give my brain a break for a couple of seconds, provided I dodge efficiently enough. My damage is extra pitiful this time around, just like with Malaketh, but Malaketh's first phase was at least extremely easy, with a few lengthy breaks squeezed in. This is going to be a long affair where I've got to be firing on all cylinders at all times. Any small mistake in my roll timing will get caught up by follow-up attacks or one of his numerous explosions, and I don't get any of my resources back before having to fight the Elden Beast. So I can't just win. I have to excel. Aside from one attempt where I died in 90 seconds, my first attempts weren't too bad. There's a little more I can bring in here though, so it's time for one last detour. I'm honestly probably already pretty overleveled for just about any other run I could possibly do, but uh, this isn't just any other run. At this point, my vigor is already maxed and I don't really need to worry about my stamina, and levels don't even increase my defense in any noticeable amount anymore, but there's still a few options. I go and collect a larval tier so I can respec and shift a bunch of my points into arcane for some sweet, sweet holy defense. I then throw myself off my favorite cliff until I run out of foul feet and hit an extremely unnecessary level of 178 for even more arcane and holy defense, and then realize that I'm dumb. I completely forgot about this, but strength increases physical defense too, so I'd go find another easy larval tier and respec one more time. I dropped my endurance to 30, since stamina wasn't much of an issue, and my vigor to 79, since the points are mostly useless past the soft cap of 60. I also got my strength and arcane both to around 40, or whatever gave me that extra point of defense. It probably wasn't worth min-maxing this much for that extra point, but I can't understate how much I was expecting the run to be unfinishable even at this point. In my mind, with these long, drawn-out fights, every point matters. And finally, I head down to the Blood Swamps to nab the Halig Drake Talisman Plus 2 for a significant boost of holy damage negation, and it's back to Radagascar. I traded out the Ritual Sword Talisman for this new defensive option because I don't have any delusions about staying at max health for any significant period of time here. I can't tell you if all the extra levels really helped much, but those extra defense stats paired with the new Talisman seem to be paying dividends because my next attempts were looking pretty dang good. On my third attempt after these changes, I got this run. Killed at 20%, completely out of flasks. This was promising, but I can't keep spending this many resources and expect to defeat the Elden Beast after this. I'm taking damage from a lot of random attacks throughout this fight, but by far the biggest killer here is Radagon's teleport ability. This move is the king of mix-ups. He'll teleport far away to strike you with darts or lightning, medium range to lunge at you, or close range to combo you or drop an exploding lightning bolt or a thing, and sometimes just to posture on you. The teleport hits you if you're in range when it finishes, and the dodge timing is extra weird. You'll get hit if you roll immediately, and you'll get hit if you time it too late. It doesn't do a lot of damage, and you can continue rolling safely out of every follow-up attack except one. If you're hit by the teleport when he chooses this specific follow-up attack, it'll almost always hit, resulting in a substantial amount of your health being lost. With my nutty health regeneration, I can very easily afford to get hit by a teleport explosion every once in a while, 
but this combo means that I really have to learn the weird timing of this teleport and get good at dodging it. Most other builds can get away with getting rocked by this during the fight since they can likely take Radagon down before resources become a real problem, but for me, in this run, this is more of a test of endurance than it is of skill, and I have to reach the Elden Beast with enough resources to survive that fight. As the time flies by and the number of attempts grows, I'm slowly avoiding more and more of these teleports and building overall consistency with the fight until finally, after 50 minutes and no flasks remaining, Radagon goes down for the first time. I didn't think it was possible. Radagon is an absolute monster and somehow I managed to clutch the fight, but I don't have any flasks left. At least now I know it's possible and I can now see what I'm up against with the Elden Beast. Let's see just how long I can last against this thing and try to get some information before my inevitable death. The Elden Beast loves to run away, so theoretically I should be able to regenerate a lot of health and get at least a somewhat respectable attempt and relearn some of the dodge timings I'll need to master and I'm dead. Well, that lasted about 40 seconds. I guess I get to fight Radagon again. Yay! Three Radagon attempts later, we get our second try. This time I managed to take him down in 47 minutes with four flasks, an FP flask, and my Physic flask still in tow. Not sure how I shaved three minutes off the fight, but I'll take it. And even though I still don't think that this is doable with this few flasks remaining, we're in a great position to learn, and boy do I. The biggest lesson I learned here is that the Elden Beast doesn't run away quite as much as we all think it does. I mean, sure, it still runs away a lot, but when you're not doing damage to it, then it's perfectly happy to sit there and actually use its sword against you. Specifically, this lunging attack and this three-hit combo are the best choices it could possibly make for me. They're both really easy to dodge and give me a very nice punish window. This hand slam explosion attack is less easy to dodge, but not too dangerous and also very punishable. This holy nuke attack looks extremely dangerous and like I'd really rather not get hit by it, but leaves the boss wide open after it goes off. In a somewhat cruel twist of fate, it turns out that I'm running out of stamina quite a lot while exploiting the Elden Beast's punish windows, Maybe I should have left a few more points in Endurance or re-equipped my green dog talisman, but we're gonna have to roll with what we got since I don't really have the courage to trade out any of my current talismans. Oh, and did you know that this seemingly infinite arena actually has edges? Because I certainly didn't. Hmm, I hope that doesn't become a problem in the future. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. I've never seen this boss swing its sword as much as it does during this attempt, and I begin to think that Maybe it isn't hopeless after all. I'm doing pretty well, but in another cruel twist of fate, this attempt ends with one of those three hit melee combos that I said was so easy to dodge, with three flasks and my physics still unused after only seven minutes. Well, that's a little embarrassing. That's okay though, because on my next attempt, after only 45 minutes this time and 10 flasks and a physics still in my possession, we get yet another try. Somehow I'm continuing to shave time off of Radagon. Remember that frantic stabbing attack I mentioned that I never want to see again? Well, here's why. This attack sucks. The pattern is weird and the boss only ever uses it when you can't see it wind up because of the camera. Sure, my health wasn't full, but it also wasn't extremely low and it knocked me out with three of its hits. This one really hurt. By now, I must be getting pretty good at fighting Radagon or something because on my next attempt, again, and in only 41 minutes this time, I managed to get another try. Somehow, I got through the fight with using only a single flask and I still had two casts of bestial vitality remaining before I had to use my FP flask. This is extremely promising, and this fight was starting to go well. Very well, in fact. 25% down. I'm beginning to see in code at this point. I know what the boss wants to do before it acts. I realize that the Elden Ring attack isn't used quite as often as I thought it was. I never learn how to properly dodge this very, very scary wave of gold. 50% down. And that's when it appears. The Elden Stars. You know it. 
You love it. The spell that follows you around spitting holy bullets at you for years. The individual shots don't do a lot of damage, but I know that if I let it sit there and pelt me, it's gonna be problematic. Turns out it's not too difficult to do a few evasive maneuvers and trick it into going really far in the opposite direction. But the real danger with this move is in how it distracts you from the bigger threat, the Elden Beast itself. I managed to get the star ball off my tail, but take a scary amount of damage from the star shards from the beast. I managed to get out of that relatively unscathed, crisis averted for now, I guess. Except now this move is a part of the boss's arsenal, and it's all up to RNG to decide how dangerous the combo is going to be each time the Elden Stars come out. Good luck, I guess. 75% down, with five flasks, a physic, and three bestial vitalities left. It's happening. My damage is outpacing my resource expenditure by a very healthy amount, but I'm getting nervous, and that makes me sloppy. 20% left. Things are starting to look hairy when this happens. Man, that was close. If I missed the roll on that last sword beam, I was dead for sure. Remember those arena walls I mentioned? Yeah, that's what happened here. These walls don't appear unless you're right up on them, and I had no idea I was that close to one until it was too late, and then I panicked hard. You don't know true fear until you're this deep into a boss fight in a challenge this stupid and have something like this happen. Holy crap. Now my flask count isn't looking so great anymore, and even worse, I'm shook. That was not good for the nerves. 15% left. The boss pulls out the Elden Stars and swings with a melee combo. Somehow I managed to dodge the combo, but I don't expect this grab, so I'm hit. And I truly thought I was dead here, but luckily I was at full health and it only took out half of it. Painful and scary, but I'm alive. And by this point, I'm completely out of FP. 10% more to go, and I'm hit with this ridiculous combo. Elden Stars followed by the boss's Star Shards, followed immediately by Sword Beams. I count my lucky Elden Stars that I somehow managed to get out of this one with only 20% health loss. One Flask, and one Physic left. <laughs> We're cutting this one extremely close. Only 5% remaining. We're so close, I can taste it. And I'm hit with the frantic stab attack I love so much while Elden Stars breathe down my neck. I finally chug my physic for a massive heal and a powerful heal over time and brace myself for anything. One last flask remaining and then... It's... it's over? I did it? I actually won? I actually won! The Elden Beast is dead! I didn't even think I'd be able to pull it off, but I did. I was seriously considering using one of the couple different glitches to skip this fight. I even had some joke edits planned out for it, but <laughs> wow, I guess I didn't need that after all. Miraculously, beating these fights only took seven hours over the course of three days. <laughs> that seems like a lot, but it's still less than the Fire Giant. Time to beat, one hour, 51 minutes, and 45 seconds. 41 minutes for Radagon, and the rest for the Beast. Oh man, what a journey, what a terrible idea, what a ridiculously long script. I know this video is probably overly long, but I didn't want to just make a challenge run video. I wanted to recreate the journey, the struggle, the pain, and the growth that went into this challenge. I lived this, but it was extremely cool to experience how my mind adapted and learned these bosses and their patterns in such depth to make this possible, especially the ones that I came into with zero confidence or thought were going to be impossible to beat in this way. I may have cheated on two of them, but that's miles better than I ever hoped for, and I can now say that I beat Elden Ring with just the Briar armor. I'm sure that'll be a great pickup line, and if I'm not the first one with this specific challenge run video, I'm going to be real sad. As of writing this, I still don't see anything in the YouTube search results, but I made the script too long and might lose out during the editing process. Crap. But before I sign off for good, there's one last boss to take out. The toughest boss in the game, and the one that will truly validate the run. This is it. 
The ultimate challenge in this video game, the Soldier of Godric. The lore says that this soldier heroically defended the lands between by himself from the wrath of the Outer Gods before being imprisoned in this cave and he's dead. Hmm, must be bugged. Well, that's it. Hope you enjoyed this video and for real no more challenge runs for a while. After this one, I think I'm officially burnt out on Elden Ring, at least for a while. This is probably the dumbest and most difficult challenge that can be done, with the exception of the same run at rune level 1 with no incantations and no health regeneration. Any variation of a bare fist run will also be way, way harder than this, so um, best of luck to the god gamers out there that attempt those. Big thanks to my patrons for supporting me through these hard times, and big thanks to you for sitting through this stupidly long challenge run video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Fun fact, as long as this video is, it's still not as long as it took me to beat those final bosses.